Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Mike Dellinger. I'm an assistant professor in the departments of surgery and molecular biology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. I'm also the director of research for the Lymphatic Malformation Institute. I completed my PhD at the University of Arizona under Marley Switty and Bob Erickson. And then I completed my postdoctoral studies at UT Southwestern Medical Center under Rolf Brecken. I started my lab in 2014, and my lab is focused on identifying biomarkers and treatments for Gorham Stout disease, generalized lymphatic anomaly, and Kaposi-form lymphangiomatosis. The title of my presentation today is Vanishing Act, Lymphatic Vessels and Disappearing Bones. I would just like to take this time to acknowledge the 2020 LEARN Symposium Series sponsors and to thank them for their support. I would also like to take this time to read this important disclaimer. So LEARN sponsored information is provided for use for you in consultation with your healthcare professional and is not meant to take the place of healthcare or, uh, or services you may need. Please see your primary healthcare provider about any personal health concerns. With respect to disclosures, I am the Director of Research for the Lymphatic Malformation Institute. The LMI is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that funds research on rare lymphatic anomalies, and the LMI has funded some of the work that I will show today. So like I said, my lab studies lymphatic anomalies Lymphatic anomalies are diseases caused by errors in the development of the lymphatic system. Unfortunately, very little is known about lymphatic anomalies, and this gap in knowledge has made it difficult to identify treatments for patients. Our hope is that our work will provide mechanistic insight into the pathogenesis of these diseases and new treatments for patients. We're currently focused on lymphatic diseases that affect bone, Normal bones do not have lymphatics. However, patients with either Gorham Stout disease or generalized lymphatic anomaly develop ectopic lymphatics in bone and gradually lose bone. And today I'm going to present my lab's latest work on the development of lymphatics in bone. Before I get into my work on Gorham Stout disease, I just wanna briefly introduce the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system encompasses lymph, lymphocytes, lymphoid organs, and a network of vessels which are present in most regions of the body. And these vessels perform several important physiological functions. Lymphatic vessels are involved in the immune response, they absorb and transport dietary fats, and they return fluid and macromolecules to the blood vascular system. And there are two distinct types of vessels which work together to carry out these important physiological functions. The lymphatic network begins with initial lymphatics, which are also called lymphatic capillaries. And you can see in this schematic that initial lymphatics form a highly branched blind-ended network. And these vessels are the uh, vessels which absorb fluid and macromolecules from the interstitium. They then transport this fluid as lymph to the second type of lymphatic, known as a collecting lymphatic. Collecting lymphatics are surrounded by a layer of lymphatic muscle cells, and they contain intraluminal valves which partition the vessel into discrete contractile elements called lymphangions. The pumping of lymphangions propels lymph to lymph nodes and ultimately to the thoracic duct, which empties into the left subclavian vein. The differences between initial and collecting lymphatics arise during embryonic and postnatal development this slide summarizes the current model for the development of the mammalian lymphatic system. During embryonic development, a subset of blood endothelial cells begin to express the transcription factor, PROX1. 
That causes these endothelial cells to differentiate into lymphatic endothelium. These cells then migrate away from embryonic veins and reorganize to form sacs. Sprouts from these sacs give rise to a primitive plexus of vessels. Additionally, isolated cells called lymphangioplasts contribute to the formation of this primitive network. Later in development, a subset of vessels uh, develop valves and recruit lymphatic muscle cells and mature into collecting vessels. So at the end of development, a hierarchical network is present comprised of initial and collecting vessels. Importantly, errors in this process can cause human disease. And the first lymphatic disease that I'm going to talk about today is Gorham-Stout disease. Like I said before, patients with Gorham-Stout disease develop ectopic lymphatics in bone, and they gradually lose bone. Gorham-Stout disease is a sporadic disease. It is not inherited. It's thought to be caused by a somatic genetic mutation. However, a mutation has not yet been published for this disease. Since 1955, approximately 300 cases of Gorham-Stout disease have been published, and these case reports have increased our understanding of the clinical features of this disease. So Gorham-Stout disease can present at any age, however, it's typically diagnosed in children and young adults. It can be restricted to a single bone, however, it typically involves multiple bones. And when multiple bones are affected, they're usually bones that are next to one another. The course of this disease is unpredictable. In some patients, the osteolytic process occurs slowly over a period of years, whereas in others, it occurs rapidly over a period of months. One very interesting feature of this disease is that it will spontaneously arrest after a period of activity. So when a patient is initially diagnosed with this disease, it's unclear if their disease is in an active or inactive state, and there are currently no biomarkers available to help make that distinction. And making that distinction is important because that could impact the treatment of the patient. Importantly, there's no evidence of new bone formation after the disease arrests once the bone disappears. It is gone for good and does not regenerate. This disease can affect any bone in the body, but it typically affects the ribs and spine. And thoracic involvement is associated with a poor prognosis because these patients tend to develop chylothorax, which can cause respiratory distress, failure, and death. Unfortunately, the mechanisms driving lymphangiogenesis in Gorm-Stout disease are poorly understood. However, the molecular mechanisms controlling the development of the lymphatic vasculature uh, are well understood. And over the past 20 years, VEGFC has emerged as the principal driver of lymphangiogenesis. VEGFC is a growth factor that can activate the receptor tyrosine kinases, VEGFR2 and VEGFR3. And both of these receptors are expressed by lymphatic endothelial cells and can induce lymphangiogenesis. Studies uh, with model organisms have revealed that VEGFC is required for the proper development of the lymphatic system. Mice that lack two copies of the VEGFC gene fail to develop lymphatics, and mice that lack just a single copy of the VEGFC gene develop significantly fewer lymphatics than wild-type mice. Conversely, overexpression of VEGFC has been shown to drive lymphangiogenesis in various settings. So overexpression of VEGFC in the lung induces lymphangiogenesis in the lung. Overexpression of VEGFC in the pancreas induces lymphangiogenesis in the pancreas. And overexpression of VEGFC in tumors can induce the formation of lymphatics in tumors. So based on those observations, we hypothesize that overexpression of VEGFC in bone would stimulate the formation of lymphatics in bone and bone loss. To test this hypothesis, we created transgenic mice that overexpressed VEGFC in osteocytes, osteoblasts, and chondrocytes. And those are three cell types found in bone. We have used the TET off system to spatially and temporally control the expression of VEGFC. In our system, the Osterix promoter drives the expression of a tetracycline transactivator. In the absence of doxycycline, the tetracycline transactivator induces the expression of VEGFC. When doxycycline is present, it binds to the tetracycline transactivator 
and prevents the expression of VEGFC. And we give doxycycline to our mice by putting it in their drinking water. So mice on normal drinking water express VEGFC in bone, whereas mice that are on doxycycline drinking water do not express VEGFC in bone. In this experiment, we inhibited the expression of VEGFC during embryonic development and then induced its expression during postnatal development and collected bones from mice that were 35 days old. We then sectioned these bones and stained them with the antibody that recognizes LIV1, which is a marker of lymphatic endothelium. And we found that bones from control mice did not contain lymphatics, whereas bones from our mutant animals were filled with lymphatic vessels. So this result shows that overexpression of VEGFC in bone is sufficient to drive the development of lymphatics in bone. We then use these mice to develop a, uh, to gain a better understanding of how lymphatics form in bone. But before I show some of our other experiments, I just wanna briefly go over how we quantify lymphatics in bone because I'm going to be referring uh, to graphs that contain a lymphatic vessel index throughout this presentation. So what we do is we take a picture and we then place a grid over that picture and count the number of times the grid lines intersect either within or on a lymphatic and we refer to this as our lymphatic vessel index. So like I said before, VEGFC can activate the receptor tyrosine kinases VEGFR2 and VEGFR3. So we first asked if whether VEGFR2 or VEGFR3 activity was required for the formation of lymphatic syndrome. To answer that question, we treated mice with either DC101 or MF431C1. DC101 is a monoclonal antibody that blocks VEGFR2, and MF431C1 is a monoclonal antibody that blocks VEGFR3. We found that uh, inhibition of VEGFR2 with DC101 had a modest effect on the formation of lymphatics in bone. In contrast, inhibition of VEGFR3 with MF431C1 completely prevented the formation of lymphatics in bone. So this result shows that VEGFR3 is required for the formation of bone lymphatics. We then set out to determine the cellular origin of these atopic lymphatic endothelial cells in bone. Previous studies have shown that lymphatic endothelial cells can arise from blood endothelial cells, from mesenchymal stem cells, from cells in the hematopoietic lineage, and also from pre-existing lymphatic endothelial cells. So to determine whether the lymphatic endothelial cells in bone came from pre-existing lymphatic endothelial cells, we performed a lineage tracing study. And in this experiment, we used a tamoxifen-inducible lymphatic Cree to label lymphatic endothelial cells with GFP. We then let the tamoxifen wash out. We then induced the expression of VEGFC in bone and then stained tissues for GFP. So in this experiment, if the lymphatics express GFP, that means they came from pre-existing lymphatics. If the lymphatics do not express GFP, then that means uh, that there is some other source for these lymphatic endothelial cells in bone. So in this lineage tracing study, we used a, a PROX1 tamoxifen inducible CRE, and we also used the MTMG reporter mouse. The MTMG reporter causes CRE positive cells and their descendants to express GFP. Uh, before we performed the lineage tracing experiment, we performed several control experiments so we showed that the PROX1 CRE is not expressed in normal bone, that this CRE is not active in the absence of tamoxifen, and we showed that um, the CRE protein moves out of the nucleus within two weeks of mice having received their last dose of tamoxifen. We then performed several pilot studies to figure out the experimental conditions that would allow lymphatics to develop in bone after the tamoxifen washout period, and we found if we gave mice doxycycline from embryonic day 0.5, to postnatal day 21, they would develop lymphatic vessels after this tamoxifen, in, in bone, in, after this tamoxifen washout period. So we collected bones uh, from mice and then assessed GFP expression by lymphatics in bone. 
And in this experiment, uh, we stain uh, consecutive sections with antibodies against LIV1 and GFP, and found that uh, greater than 90% of the lymphatics in bone were GFP positive. So this result suggests that the majority of lymphatic endothelial cells in bone originate from pre-existing PROX1 positive lymphatic endothelial cells. We then set out to determine where these PROX1 positive lymphatic endothelial cells were coming from. So to do that, we performed a time course experiment where we collected tissues from 20, 24, 28, and 32 day old mice, and then assessed lymphatics in the periosseous muscle, in the cortical bone, and marrow cavity. So I'm going to show results first for the periosseous muscle. So we found in our mutant animals, lymphatics in the periosseous muscle tissue became hyperplastic over time. When we looked at the cortical bone, we saw that the lymphatics in the periosseous muscle grew. They then breached this connective tissue structure called the periosteum. This is a connective tissue that covers the outside surface of bone. So the vessels breached the periosteum and then came into direct contact with bone. These lymphatic vessels then gradually invaded the bone until at later stages, they reached the marrow cavity. So our current model for the development of lymphatics in bone is that regional lymphatics invade bone, where regional lymphatics grow, excuse me, breach the periosteum, and then gradually uh, invade the cortical bone until they reach the marrow cavity. We then wanted to figure out how can lymphatic vessels actually pass through cortical bone. So we first asked, could lymphatic endothelial cells directly degrade bone? To answer that question, we plated lymphatic endothelial cells and osteoclasts on an osteoassay plate. This is a plate that has uh, calcium phosphate crystals, which mimic bone. And we found that osteoclasts but not the lymphatic endothelial cells were actually create these resorption pits and degrade this calcium phosphate surface. So this result suggests that lymphatic endothelial cells themselves are not capable of directly degrading bone. Lymphatic endothelial cells then must, may work with another cell type to degrade bone. In bone, bone mass is regulated by the activity of two different cell types. So osteoblasts are cuboidal cells that synthesize bone and osteoclasts are the cells that degrade bone. So because several case reports had suggested that osteoclasts play a role in bone resorption in gorm stout disease, we first assessed osteoclasts in our mice. To do that, we stained tissue sections for trap activity. This is a special histologic stain that causes osteoclasts to appear as either pink or red. And we found that our mutant animals had significantly more osteoclasts than our control animals. To support this finding, we also measured the circulating levels of CTX1 in control in mutant animals. CTX1 is a fragment of collagen one that's created when osteoclasts degrade bone. And it's a common uh, circulating biomarker of osteoclast activity. We found that the level of CTX1 was significantly higher in our mutant animals than our control animals. So together, these results suggest that our mutant animals have more osteoclasts than control mice. We then looked at the relationship between osteoclasts and lymphatics that were invading bone and found that osteoclasts were closely associated with invading lymphatics and appeared to be creating a path through the bone for the lymphatics. So to determine whether osteoclasts were required for lymphatics to invade bone or facilitated the invasion of bone by lymphatics, we used a genetic approach to disrupt osteoclast development in our mice. Mice that are homozygous for a mutation called OP fail to develop osteoclasts, whereas mice that are heterozygous for this mutation do have osteoclasts. So we bred this mutation into our Gorm Stout model and then collected tissues from mice when they were 32 days old. We found that in our mutant animals, that 
there was a normal periosseous lymphangiogenesis. However, these lymphatics failed to invade the cortical bone and reach the marrow cavity. So these results suggest that osteoclasts uh, play a role in the formation of lymphatics in bone. So what I've shown so far is that expression in VEGFC in bone induces the formation of lymphatics in bone. We then wanted to figure out whether we could reverse this phenotype by inhibiting the expression of VEGFC in mice with established disease. And there was reason to believe that the lymphatic phenotype of our mice would not be reversible. And that's because people have previously shown in other models that lymphatic vessels do not regress following the withdrawal of a growth promoting stimulus. And an example of that is shown here where uh, VEGFC was expressed in the airways of mice and that induced the formation of lymphatic vessels in the airway. And these lymphatic vessels persisted even up to 19 months after the withdrawal of VEGFC. So we went into this experiment thinking that the lymphatics that formed in bone in our mice would not disappear following the withdrawal of VEGFC. So in this experiment, we induced the expression of VEGFC in bone for 35 days, and then we inhibited its expression for either 28 or 56 days. And what we're looking at are longitudinal sections of ribs from control and mutant animals. In the control mouse, you can see there are no lymphatic vessels in the bone or in the marrow cavity, and there are a few lymphatic vessels in the surrounding periosseous muscle. When we overexpress VEGFC in bone, that stimulates the formation of lymphatics in bone. It also induces the growth of lymphatics in the periosseous muscle. And to our surprise, the abnormal lymphatics in bone, but not the abnormal lymphatics in the periosseous muscle, disappeared following the withdrawal of VEGFC. So it could be that um, lymphatics in bone depend on continued VEGFC signaling for their survival because bone lacks maintenance factors for lymphatics. Bones do not normally have lymphatics, therefore they would not have, we would not expect them to have everything required to maintain a lymphatic network. Alternatively, bones may have uh, inhibitory factors whose effects could be overcome by overexpressing VEGFC in bone. And we're currently working on distinguishing between those two possibilities. And we think pursuing this could lead to the identification of new anti-lymphangiogenic targets or drugs. So in addition to characterizing the lymphatics in our mice, we also looked at the reversibility of the bone phenotype of our mice. So overexpression of VEGFC in bone causes bones to have a moth-eaten appearance. These bones then switch back to having a normal appearance following the withdrawal of VEGFC. And when we look at cross sections of bone, we can see that bones from mutant animals that express VEGFC in bone are significantly porous. And the porosity of these bones goes back to normal or decreases following the withdrawal of VEGFC. So to summarize this part of my talk, we've shown that overexpression of VEGFC in bone causes a phenotype that resembles Gorham Stout disease. Our mutant animals have lymphatic vessels in their bone. They have thin porous cortical bone, and they also develop chylothorax. We showed that VEGFR3 is required for the formation of lymphatics in bone, and that bone lymphatic endothelial cells, or at least the majority of bone lymphatic endothelial cells, originate from pre-existing lymphatic endothelial cells. We also presented work which suggests that osteoclasts facilitate the development of lymphatics in bone. And I've shown that the phenotype of our mutant mice is at least partially reversible. We can cause the abnormal lymphatics in bone, but not the abnormal lymphatics in periosseous muscle uh, to disappear. I'm now gonna spend the remainder of my time talking about a related lymphatic disease called generalized lymphatic anomaly. So several years ago, Boston Children's Hospital was analyzing their Gorham Stout disease patient population and noticed that it was comprised of two groups of patients. There are some patients whose cortical bone was destroyed. Those patients kept the name Gorham Stout disease. And there are some patients whose cortical bone was spared. And these patients were renamed as having generalized lymphatic anomaly. So generalized lymphatic anomaly or GLA is very similar to Gorham Stout disease. It is a sporadic disease. So to test the hypothesis that GLA is caused by a somatic genetic mutation, 
my collaborator sequenced affected and unaffected tissue from nine patients with a diagnosis of GLA. And through this work, he identified somatic activating mutations in PIK3CA in five out of the nine patients. And importantly, in two of these patients, he was able to show that the mutation was present in lymphatic endothelial cells that were isolated from the affected tissue. PIK3CA is a gene that encodes for the P110 uh, alpha protein. And this protein is the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase. And the mutations that were present in our patients are mutations that are also present in cancer patients, as well as in pros patients, and they're mutations which cause hyperactivation of the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR signaling pathway. So to characterize the effect excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells has on lymphatic development, we use the CREELOC system to express a mutant form of PIK3CA in PROX1 positive cells. So in this experiment, we injected mice with tamoxifen to induce the expression of PIK3CA, mutant PIK3CA in lymphatic endothelial cells. And then we collected ears from mice um, either four or eight weeks after they received their last injection of tamoxifen. And these ear skins uh, were stained with an anti light one antibody. And what we found was that the lymphatic network in our mutant animals became hyperplastic over time. In addition to looking at these soft tissues from the mice, we also examined bones. And we found that bones from our mutant animals developed lymphatic vessels. And there are no lymphatic vessels in bone in our control animals. Although the mice developed lymphatics in bone, uh, their bones appeared structurally normal. And this is likely because we were just examining an early stage of disease in these mice. And so the greatest number of lymphatics we actually ever observed in, an, in a bone was around 10 or 12. Um, and unfortunately, we were not able to get bones from older mice uh, because they developed a pleural effusion and died. In addition to assessing lymphatic structure, we also assessed lymphatic function in these animals. So in this experiment, we injected mice with tamoxifen to induce the expression of PIK3CA in lymphatic endothelial cells. And then we injected mice with Evans blue dye four weeks after they received their last injection of tamoxifen. And in this experiment, we inject uh, the hind paw and then assessed the iliac lymph nodes. So we found that Evans blue dye was transported from the hind paw to the iliac lymph nodes in all of our control animals. However, the iliac lymph nodes in our mutant animals did not fill with Evans blue dye. So this result shows that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells impairs lymphatic function. Rapamycin is an FDA-approved mTOR1 inhibitor. And because the uh, mutation in PI3 kinase leads to the activation of mTOR, we assess the effect of rapamycin on the phenotype of our mutant animals. So we performed both prevention and intervention studies. And this is, these are the results for our prevention study. So in this experiment, we injected mice with tamoxifen and then began to treat mice with either vehicle or rapamycin a day after they received their last injection of tamoxifen. And then we collected tissues from mice uh, four weeks later. In this setting, we found that uh, rapamycin could prevent lymphatic hyperplasia in our mutant mice. We also assessed lymphatic function, and we found that iliac lymph nodes did not fill with Evans blue dye in any of our vehicle-treated mice. In contrast, all of our rapamycin-treated mice had iliac lymph nodes fill with Evans blue dye. So this result shows that rapamycin can prevent lymphatic dysfunction in our mutant animals. We then performed an intervention study where we let mice develop the disease, and then we treated them with either vehicle or rapamycin. And we found that in this setting, rapamycin could attenuate lymphatic hyperplasia in our mice. We also looked at bones uh, from our mice and found that uh, rapamycin could prevent the formation of lymphatics in bone. 
and we assessed uh, lymphatic function in our mice. And I just want to point out at the four week time point at which we start treatment with uh, rapamycin, this is a time point at which the lymphatic network is dysfunctional in our animals. And we found to our surprise that after three weeks of treatment with rapamycin, we could partially normalize lymphatic function in nine out of 11 mice. So in nine out of 11 rapamycin treated animals, we could get at least one iliac lymph node filling with Evans blue dye. So this shows that rapamycin, rapamycin can partially restore uh, lymphatic function in mice with established disease. In addition to treating mice with rapamycin, uh, my collaborator treated four GLA patients with a PIK3CA mutation with rapamycin. And he found that uh, the, the biggest effect that this had on these patients was a reduction in pain. And our findings are in agreement with case reports in series that GLA patients respond to rapamycin. And others have reported that rapamycin can lead to the resolution of uh, pleural effusions and also the shrinkage of uh, lymphatic malformations in patients. So to summarize this part of my presentation, we've uh, shown that GLA can be caused by somatic activating mutations in PIK3CA. We've shown that excessive PI3 kinase signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells causes lymphatic hyperplasia and dysfunction in mice. And it also leads to the formation of ectopic lymphatics in bone. Uh, by performing prevention studies, we show that rapamycin can prevent lymphatic hyperplasia and dysfunction. And then through our intervention studies, we found that rapamycin can partially normalize lymphatic function in mice with established disease. And we think that our studies really provide um, the molecular rationale for treating patient, GLA patients with rapamycin, and we provide further evidence that patients with GLA respond to rapamycin. So to conclude, uh, my collaborators have identified the first genetic mutation for GLA, and my lab has developed the first animal models for gorm stout disease in GLA. And we believe that these animal models are helping us develop a better understanding of the pathophysiology of these diseases. And we hope that our work will lead to the repurposing of FDA-approved drugs for gorm stout disease in GLA and enable a precision medicine approach for the treatment of these life-threatening diseases. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people in my lab that have worked on this project, my numerous uh, collaborators, and also my funding uh, from the Department of Surgery at UT Southwestern, the Foster Family Foundation, the NIH, and the Lymphatic Malformation Institute. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Oh, and uh, I guess I need to say uh, the questions, uh, if you could type them into the Q&A box uh, that you can find either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen. Oh, there's some questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, the question is, does rapamycin affect non-lymphatic cells as well? Do you think that amelioration of the lymphatic phenotype is a direct effect on lymphatic endothelial cells, or may it be indirect? And that is a great question. Um, one of the things that we did to try to address that question, but we ran into some experimental difficulties, was to actually delete mTORC1 signaling, used a genetic approach to disrupt mTORC1 signaling in lymphatic endothelial cells to see if that alone could uh, prevent the formation of our mutant phenotype of our mice. Unfortunately, we ran into some difficulty with that experiment. So at least in vitro, we can show that rapamycin can have a direct effect on uh, lymphatic endothelial cells, but rapamycin's uh, effect on other cells um, in the microenvironment could also play a role, um, could also um, affect the response to rapamycin. All right, we have another question in the uh, chat box. Since GSD and GLA are thought to be somatic mutations, why does the disease show multifocal involvement as opposed to just regional involvement? 
That is a great question. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a definitive answer for that question, but we can put forth a hypothesis. And I think that it could be that it relates to when the mutation occurs during development. Uh, so if the mutation occurs early in development, then perhaps that gives an opportunity for that mutation to be present in more lymphatic endothelial cells, causing a more uh, widespread phenotype, uh, rather than if it just occurs later in development, uh, it being restricted to a single region. But it's a, a great question. Uh, another question. You had these findings in GLA patients. Uh, what about Gorham's? Um, so we're currently working uh, with other investigators to try to identify uh, genetic mutations for Gorham's stout disease. And that's an ongoing work and we hope that uh, once we get those mutations, we'll be able to, to then generate the next generation of animal models and begin to test therapies, uh, perform preclinical experiments with those animal models, just like we did with the PROX1 pic 3 ca mice for GLA. Was there any, uh, this is from Dave Zaveja, was there any uh, concomitant change in the conversion canals in the bone associated with the lymphatic invasion? Uh, unfortunately, we did not uh, look at haversion canals in our mutant animals. Uh, that's something that I think we could look at um, in the future, definitely. Another question, any idea why Gorham stout disease sometimes stops on its own? Do the mutant clones die out? Oh, that's a, a great question. Um, that is a possibility. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a, a great answer to that question as to why this disease arrests. Uh, one thing I would like to do is when we do have an animal model, we can then test, um, we would then have a system that would allow us to test various hypotheses to, uh, to determine why this uh, disease can arrest. Any, oh. You observe various PIK3CA mutations. Are there different responses to rapamycin? Unfortunately, we only had the uh, four patients um, that were genotyped for the PIK3CA, and uh, and to my knowledge, there wasn't, uh, there aren't enough patients, at least in our small cohort, to determine whether or not there are genotype-phenotype uh, relationships. Sorry, I'm going to also go to the. Um, I've been open on the chat. I need to go to the Q and A. Uh, over here because there are other questions there. Um, does uh, sultronic acid help GLA patients? And might it help to combine uh, sultronic acid and rapamycin uh, therapy? I, I think that's a great question and that's one thing that we're doing with our uh, VEGFC model is we are treating with uh, sultronic acid and rapamycin. Another question, how do you explain the loss of function in PIK3CA mediated GLA patients and the reversibility? So with the PIK3CA mutations, they're actually gain of function uh, mutations, which result in excessive PI3 kinase signaling. Um, so we think that this, by constitutively activating the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, that's leading to this excessive lymphangiogenesis that we're seeing both in our mice and in patients. Do we know how proliferative lymphatic endothelial cells are in vivo? Um, we've looked at uh, proliferation markers in wild type mice and in our mutant animals. And uh, I, what I can say is at least in this setting, we see an increase in proliferation in our mutant animals. I don't know what the um, sort of like the uh, uh, the typical half-life is or of that lymphatic endothelial cells or how often they proliferate just in a normal in vivo setting. Our son who has been, our son who has KLA and has been on sirolimus and zol, uh, zoldronic acid and seen positive response, any thoughts about what the mechanism might be? Um, that could be by both targeting the lymphatic endothelial cells and the osteoclasts. Um, an alternative might be that the zoldronic acid can also affect uh, uh, the uh, post-translational modification of 
small G proteins. Um, so it may be affecting uh, the, uh, a pathway at two different levels, like the, N the NRAS processing as well as um, mTOR signaling. Would a PI3 kinase inhibitor like BYL work better than rapamycin? That's one thing that we can test with our animal models. There are definitely, uh, there's a very high profile paper on BYL719 for um, uh, cloves, and uh, that's a drug that we are uh, very interested in testing in our mice. Jack, what areas to study do you feel will assist in finding biomarkers in GSD? Uh, that's a great question, and I, I think what we really need is uh, to continue to collect blood from patients and uh, analyze blood to try to identify a circulating biomarker. Uh, we think that CTX1 might actually function as a biomarker for a bone disease in patients, but, and we're currently evaluating that. Uh, but we really need something like what uh, Tim and Denise have identified for KLA with angiopoietin 2. Uh, being a, a biomarker for KLA. Um, currently, we don't have that for Gorm Stout disease, but we, what we need are patient samples, and we need blood from patients actually before they're treated uh, with uh, drugs, um, because we know, at least from uh, Tim and Denise's work on KLA, that the level of angiopoietin 2 can actually is impacted by uh, serolimus. So if we could get blood from patients, serum, plasma, um, so we can then begin to screen for uh, proteins that could function as a biomarker. All right, I'm gonna go back to the chat because I think a few questions popped up there. And I apologize if I've missed your question. Um, I'm going back and forth. Um, this is another question. Uh, are the abnormal lymphatics thought to have tropism for bone as opposed to other tissues? That's a great question. Why do the lymphatics go to bone? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, an answer for that question as to why they go to bone. Uh, we've been sort of focusing more on how they're getting in there. Uh, why they're getting in there, it could just be that they're growing and they encounter bone. One interesting thing is what we're looking at now is the crosstalk between osteoclasts and lymphatic endothelial cells. So it's been shown that lymphatic endothelial cells secrete MCSF. MCSF is a factor that promotes osteoclast development and osteoclasts express VEGFC. So there could be this crosstalk between lymphatic endothelial cells and osteoclasts Classes, which could play a role in the invasion of uh, lymphatics in bone. One question I missed, did we look for differences in osteocytes? Uh, we did not assess osteocytes uh, in our uh, GSD model, um, but that is one thing that we can look at. We, and we're planning on looking at as well as osteoblasts. Well, if there are no additional questions, uh, thank you all for attending uh, my presentation and also thank you all for your wonderful questions. <laughs>